Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the first of the formed elements in the blood, and these are red blood cells. Now, red blood cell is the common name for what we typically refer to as erythrocyte. And if we break down the name erythrocyte, Site you should become very familiar with means cell, and erythro is actually a term that means red. So erythrocyte literally translates to red cell. We just throw the blood in there because they exist, of course, in the blood. Uh, we can also abbreviate these RBCs. In a clinical context, you may actually hear RBCs a lot more. Obviously easier to say than red blood cells or erythrocytes, but they all refer to the same thing. Now, in the blood, these are the most numerous of all the formed elements. So erythrocytes are more uh, numerous than leukocytes, which are white blood cells, and thrombocytes, which are platelets. And we'll be discussing those in more detail in future videos. In fact, uh, erythrocytes are numbering at about 4 to 6 million in the blood at any given time. And this number, of course, depends on a number of factors. Uh, just simply being a larger person, taller person, let's say, is going to require more blood in your body, and so you're going to have more blood cells. But also certain factors like altitude. If you live in the mountains of Colorado, where you're actually a mile above sea level, uh, you would tend to have more red blood cells in your blood. And also just the state of being physically fit or more physically fit, well, you'd actually tend to find more red blood cells in the blood of those individuals as well. Now what's the function of the red blood cells or erythrocytes? Well, they transport respiratory gases. Now, we normally think of red blood cells as transporting oxygen or O2 in the blood. Uh, we know that tissue cells require oxygen in order to continue metabolism, so in order to live. Okay. And so these red blood cells are going to play an important role in transporting that oxygen. We'll see how they do that in just a minute. Also, red blood cells transport carbon dioxide. That's a waste product of cells. Uh, so when we look at cellular respiration, cells require oxygen in order to function. Uh, they use this in their mitochondria in order to generate ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. But in the process of metabolism, they generate this waste product called carbon dioxide or CO2. And so CO2 will exit those cells into the blood, and some of it can be picked up by these red blood cells. Uh, there are other uh, ways that the blood can transport CO2, but bound to actually the hemoglobin component of the red blood cells, uh, that's actually one way CO2 is transported. And there's a few other things that red blood cells can carry. Uh, ver by virtue of the hemoglobin, they can also transport nitric oxide, which is a very potent vasodilator, a natural vasodilator. Uh, and they can also bind hydrogen ions, and so they have some degree of control of the pH of the blood. So they act as buffers as well. Now by shape, red blood cells are biconcave discs. So uh, you can actually see one of these uh, concavities on the top surface of this red blood cell. If you were to flip this over, you'd see another concavity on the bottom. And so that's what biconcave means. Okay? So as you go towards the center of the red blood cell from either the top or the bottom, it caves in. Okay? And they're disc shaped, so it's a biconcave disc. Another interesting thing about red blood cells is they actually lack organelles and a nucleus. So if they have no nucleus, that means they have no DNA. Okay? That means that they cannot uh, synthesize proteins. Okay? Because in order to synthesize proteins, uh, you actually have to have DNA, and it would have to be transcribed to RNA, and the RNA would have to be translated to protein. But they have no DNA in the first place. Uh, they don't have any ability to express any genes. They have no genes. No nucleus, no DNA. And they also lack organelles. And in particular, the one that's uh, most notable is they lack mitochondria. Now, uh, you should know this from cell respiration. Mitochondria are the sites of oxidative phosphorylation. And so when we consider oxygen, or the use of it by cells, it's the mitochondria and reactions within it that are consuming that oxygen. Well, if you have a cell whose major purpose is to bind and transport oxygen, you wouldn't want that cell actually using that oxygen, right? Because oxygen would bind to the red blood cell and it would just get used up, right? So actually, it makes sense that these cells have no mitochondria because the mitochondria are the biggest consumers of oxygen. So that means that the oxygen can come near the cell and bind, 
but it won't be utilized by the cell. In fact, these cells, red blood cells, rely pretty much totally on glycolysis for generation of energy. Now, uh, we'll talk about this in just a minute, uh, but since these cells do not have any capacity to carry out oxidative phosphorylation, they lack organelles, so they can't really do any repair for themselves, they have a pretty short lifespan, and that lifespan is a, this is a number you should know, 120 days. You might see some variation of that, like 100 to 120 days, but usually 120 is the number that everybody memorizes. And eventually I'll have a video up where we look at the lineage of red blood cells, how they're made, and their precursors, and actually uh, prior to becoming a mature red blood cell, uh, they actually jettison or lose all their organelles. In other words, they don't come from something that had no organelles or nucleus. They just lose their nucleus and organelles along the way uh, through their development. Now, this is the very important thing about a red blood cell. It contains a protein called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is mostly protein, and it has a very important cofactor, or we should say coenzyme, called heme. And we'll talk about what hemoglobin does in just one minute. But bound to every one cell, every one red blood cell, there's approximately 280 million molecules of hemoglobin. So in other words, on this one red blood cell, there's about 280 million hemoglobins. Okay? That's a lot of hemoglobins per cell. And another interesting thing about these uh, red blood cells, this is actually commonly overlooked, uh, the hemoglobins are not actually bound to the outside of the cell. Um, it's actually tempting to kind of think that they're on the outside of the cell. I used to think that when I was first taking anatomy. Uh, but it turns out that all these hemoglobins are actually within the RBC cytosol. So they're actually all intracellular. And so the oxygen molecules have to actually move through the cell membrane of the red blood cell. And once they're in the cytosol, they're picked up by the hemoglobin. So that's just an interesting fact. But what does hemoglobin do? Well, first let's look at its structure. Okay? Hemoglobin is composed of four globins. A globin is a type of protein, and it's composed of four of those. So if we actually look at this little diagram right here, we have one globin right here on the top left, one globin on the top right, these are in purple, one globin on the bottom right, and one globin on the bottom left. And so it's four of these. Each one of these globins has what we call a heme. Heme is a coenzyme, an organic coenzyme, as you can see over here. And by organic, we just mean that this heme is composed of a lot of carbon and hydrogen. Okay, that's what constitutes a coenzyme, or an organic cofactor. It's composed of carbon and hydrogen mostly. But in the center of it, uh, bound by these four central nitrogen atoms, we actually see this iron ion. It's actually an iron in the 2 plus oxidation state, so Fe2 plus. And it's actually this iron right here that's going to directly bind oxygen. Now, if we look at this hemoglobin right here, the protein part, we said that each one of these globins, there's four of them, each one has its own heme. This one down here you can't really see too well, but it's actually on the other side. Okay, Same with this one over here. So if each hemoglobin molecule has four hemes, and each heme can bind one oxygen via the iron, how many oxygens can bind per hemoglobin? Well, the answer is four. One oxygen binds here, one here, one here, and one here. So going back to this slide right here, each hemoglobin molecule can bind four oxygen molecules. So considering that we have 280 million hemoglobins per red blood cell, that means that each red blood cell can potentially bind over one billion molecules of oxygen. Now, considering that each one of these can bind over a billion oxygen molecules, and then we have four to six million of these in the blood, I don't even want to do the math right now, but it's an enormous, enormous, absolutely staggering number of oxygen molecules that can be bound at any given time. So just have an appreciation for that, because without these RBCs and hemoglobins, we would not be alive. Okay, and again, it's the iron in the 2 plus oxidation state that's actually binding the oxygen, okay? Now recall, I did say that red blood cells can actually bind carbon dioxide. Very important to understand this. The iron only binds oxygen in this context, okay? The CO2 is actually picked up by the protein. Okay, not the heme or not the iron. So actually there's amino acids 
uh, that obviously compose the protein parts. And certain amino acids can actually covalently bind the carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide binds with the protein part, with the globin molecules, specific amino acids, whereas the oxygen is picked up by the iron of the hemoglobin. Make sure to keep those things straight. And again, if we're talking about the red blood cells picking up hydrogen ions, they bind in the same way as CO2. They bind with certain amino acids on the globin parts. All right. Now, a few other aspects of red blood cells to consider. Um, we can actually increase the amount of red blood cells that are synthesized. And this is through the action of this growth factor called erythropoietin or EPO. Uh, this is the Lance Armstrong hormone. Um, many of you know that Lance Armstrong won many, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, Tour de France's. He was a professional cyclist. Uh, but one thing that was found out a lot later, and he was stripped of all his titles, is that he doped with erythropoietin. Meaning what he did is he actually took EPO, injected it into his blood, and long story short, uh, he actually increased the amount of red blood cells in his blood. So maybe he had about 6 million before, might go up to 7 million. Okay, that's considered cheating in that sport, and so he was stripped of his titles. So erythropoietin is a hormone, and it's produced by specific cells at the kidney. Okay? Um, there are cells in the kidney that are oxygen sensors, and so when oxygen levels are low, uh, the negative feedback would dictate that we make more red blood cells, because if, we have, if there's low blood oxygen, we need to have more of the molecules that bind oxygen which are hemoglobin, and they're, of course, bound to red blood cells. So make more of these. So when there's low oxygen, as sensed by these special kidney cells, they synthesize erythropoietin, and it goes to the bone, specifically bone marrow, actually red bone marrow, and it triggers erythropoiesis. So these blood cells and the synthesis of them occurs in the red bone marrow, and so erythropoietin stimulates the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. And this process is specifically termed erythropoiesis. Okay. Now a couple other things I want to mention about this is that in order to actually get more red blood cells, in order to perform erythropoiesis, we have to have several things. One, we have to have iron. Now why do we have to have iron? Because the important coenzyme here, heme, obviously has an iron in the center. So if there's no iron, we can't make any red blood cells because that's a, that's a rate-limiting step right there. Okay, We have to have that iron in order to have heme, and then we have to have heme in order to make hemoglobin. So no iron is very bad for this process. So of course we need that. We, of course, need amino acids. Why do we need amino acids? Because hemoglobin is a protein, at least the protein part. Okay? So just like we have to have iron in order to make the heme for hemoglobin, we have to have the amino acids to make the globin part of hemoglobin. And then we also need uh, several B vitamins. Um, the two most common B vitamins that you'll hear are B12, which is cobalamin, and then also folic acid. Okay? Uh, so B12, as we usually call it, usually won't hear it referred to as cobalamin. Um, this one is absolutely essential, and folic acid is as well. Uh, there's a particular biochemical reaction that occurs. Uh, it's actually the enzyme methionine synthase, and it turns out that that one enzyme actually requires both B12 and folic acid. And that enzyme is indirectly necessary for cell division. And if you're going to make more cells, you have to have cell division. And so if you don't have those specific B vitamins, you can't perform cell division and you can't make more uh, blood cells. And that actually goes for white blood cells and platelets as well. Uh, but in this context, you can't do erythropoiesis. So get your B vitamins, especially folic acid in B12. And the thing about those particular vitamins is you have to get those through the diet. Okay? And so particular diets uh, may actually have deficiencies of those vitamins, which will actually limit the amount of erythropoiesis you have. And if that is limiting enough, you can end up with anemia. Okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of red blood cells or erythrocytes. In the next videos, we're going to go over a few more aspects of red blood cells and eventually get into blood typing. Okay? Make sure to like and subscribe.